Um, this week I'm going to concentrate on the next three stanzas, the uh, 24 verses from 25 to 48. The Daleth, the He, and the Vav. Um, interesting group of letters here in Hebrew. The Daleth, there that you see, it's a Vav going up and down, and then a Vav sideways connected together. Um, stands for the number four. It means a door. It can also, uh, it connotates the idea of humble and poverty. And it's not so much humble and poverty in the regards of wealth and money. It's, it's in the estate of being mortal. Like you're humble and impoverished that you die, you can get sick. Um, vulnerable is another way to think about it. The door, too, is that idea that the structure of a house, the most vulnerable portion of the house is usually the door, because that's the portion where people enter in and out uh, 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 continuously, so it's the most vulnerable part, whereas the walls are not easily to get, easy to get through, but the door is. And I look at the way that the Daleth is made, and it, it kind of reminds me of like a little lean-to, you know, like for you country kids, you know what I'm talking about, where you just kind of, maybe your dad or your grandpa used to build little lean-tos to cover, you know, maybe the lawnmower or a pile of wood or something. It was just kind of a little addition to something. You had the structure, but then the thing added to it that was uh, useful. So the Daleth uh, stands for a door. What's interesting about the Daleth is it, it begins and it ends the name of David, King David. Begins with the Daleth and ends with the Daleth, and then it has a vav in the middle where we get David. Uh, David. Um, of course, you know that, that David means uh, beloved or loved one, which is interesting because if you think about the individual letters of the name David, you have the Daleth and then a Vav in the middle and then another Daleth, so it's like a door, connection, and door. And when we think about love, it, love is this idea of entering into relationship and being connected until you leave. That's real love. And so the individual letters of David even have some kind of mystery pointing to love. And his name literally means love. Uh, another quick piece of trivia. Uh, does anybody know how many sons David had? According to 1 Chronicles chapter 3, 19. I remember when I started this series, there's something interesting about the number 19 in Scripture. Psalm 119 is about the word. Psalm 19 is about the word. And David had 19 sons. Now, not counting his daughter Tamar and, of course, the sons that he had by the concubines, but legally we don't count those. Um, different culture, different time. Uh, but according to Scripture, he had 19 sons. <clears throat> and the uh, next letter in that next stanza uh, is a letter. It looks like he, but it's actually pronounced hey. Hey, like, hey, how are you? That hey. Um, which is interesting because it, it, it can be used as an exclamation. It could be, hey. Uh, it's more like, look, or behold. It's, uh, some have even said, even though the New Testament is written in Greek, uh, we understand that John the Baptist most likely spoke Hebrew or Aramaic. So uh, that passage in the, in the Gospels where it says that uh, John the Baptist saw Jesus and he said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. He was probably saying, Hey, look, see, behold, the Lamb of God. If he was speaking Aramaic or Hebrew, he probably used this letter. It's also a word, it's an expression to look to behold. It also has the connotations of light and also has the idea of, of the past, the present, and the future being, to, being able to see them all at the same time, which uh, denotes eternity. Past, present, future together, being able to see them. There's, there's revelation. There's also education. The idea of something being revealed to you and you, like you say, I see the light. It means you, you understand something. And so hey uh, has this, this uh, connotations in it. And hey, something I also want to point out, hey is... Um, Two of the letters in the name of God that is spoken to Moses, um, I won't go too much into that, but this idea of light twice and beholding and looking twice and eternity twice in the name of Yahweh, uh, the Tetragrammaton as it's called, has two hays in it. This, um, this hay, this light, um, is also... Uh, it, the, the letter itself is the number five in Hebrew, 
Uh, what's interesting about that is in Genesis chapter 1, light is mentioned five times. The books of the law, which give the light of the revelation of the glory of God, in the Torah we call it, the five books of Moses, five gives us the light of the knowledge of God in the law. And also, in the New Testament, we have five books of history, you know, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and Acts, which give the light of the revelation of Jesus Christ. So there's some interesting uh, things there that you can see. Uh, this connection of past, present, and future, I already said that, it's tied to eternity. And then we have this third letter, uh, which is the number six. Um, it could be wa or vav. Uh, typically, most people pronounce it. When you're pronouncing the letter itself and speaking of the letter, you say vav. But oftentimes, when you're pronouncing it, when it's coupled with others, it just makes kind of a wa sound. It's like breathing out. Hua. Um, but the letter itself is usually pronounced vav when you're teaching on the letter specifically. Now, you look at the construction of the letter. It's just this straight line with a kind of little, little hook on the end of it. It's the idea of straight up and down. The first time a vav appears in scriptures is in the first chapter of Genesis again. And it's in the very first verse when it says, in the beginning God created the heavens, vav, the earth. The heavens and the earth. The vav is literally an and. It's a connecting word. It's also symbolic of a hook that connects uh, the curtains to the pillars in the tabernacle. And itself even looks kind of like a pillar. It's straight up and down. Uh, sometimes the pictures that's used when they're teaching the, uh, the alphabet or the alphabet to Hebrew children, when they get to the vav, uh, oftentimes it's pictured as a man standing straight up with his hands in the air, reaching towards heaven. It's this idea that he's firmly planted in the earth, but he's reaching towards heaven. So it has that picture of connection between heaven and earth. And I mentioned also the pillars in the temple or the, or the poles in the tabernacle which connect the ground to the tent and hold it up towards heaven that people may enter in and find connection with God in the tabernacle. There's all these pictures and, and metaphors and connotations with the Vav. The Vav um, is used only uh, in, this, in the Hebrew text, in the, in the, in the Bible, in ancient literature, uh, it's only used by the Hebrews. There's many different uh, expressions in other languages, but this one's, um, what's the word I'm looking for? It's unique to Hebrew. This hook, this connection. This one also has practical and mystical connection with everything. When, they're, when you're teaching about this letter, when you're learning in Hebrew, that there's this idea that the Vav brings mystical or practical connection to everything. It's this idea of heaven and earth being connected, the spirit and the natural, um, of course, and in literature it's, it means and. So you're just connecting two different ideas. Well, what's cool about it is it also denotes eternity because it's the idea of the connection with the past, the present, and the future all being together as one. What's also interesting is not only is it used as an and, but can also used, be used to denote an opposite. So if I'm saying a word and, it, and it's a verb, like it's an action word that means the future, but then you put a vav in front of it, you would actually read it as meaning the past. But if it's a word that's a verb for the past and you put a vav in front of it, it means the future. So it also changes the word to connect it to its opposite end. So it has this, this idea of connection, of and, okay? Whew, didn't... Mm. This is the tough part. It gets easier from here. Uh, so kind of keep some of these ideas in mind as I'm reading through these stanzas because these very ideas appear in the text themselves. That's why these stanzas begin with these letters and that's why it's arranged this way. God did it purposefully through the psalmist who wrote. It says there in Psalm chapter 119, verse 25, Daleth, I am laid low in the dust Preserve my life according to your word. I gave an account of my ways, and you answered me. Teach me your decrees. Cause me to understand the way of your precepts, that I may meditate on your wonderful deeds. My soul is weary with sorrow. Strengthen me according to your word. Notice that the first and the last part of this stanza actually begins with the idea of the Daleth, which is to be humble, to be impoverished, to be mortal. He says, I'm laid low in the dust. It's an expression talking about how I'm a mere mortal man. I'm on my face. I'm humbling myself before you. My soul is weary with sorrow. This idea of the lowest state of a person's heart, the Daleth. Verse 29, keep me from deceitful ways. Be gracious to me and teach me your law. I have chosen the way of your faithfulness. I have set my heart on your laws. I hold fast to your statutes. Lord, do not let me be put to shame. I run in the path of your commands for you have broadened 
my understanding. Notice that the second part, the second part of this stanza begins and ends with the idea of teaching and broadening understanding, this idea of doorway into knowledge. He talks about ways. Uh, When ways are used in this passage, he says, keep me from deceitful ways. I've chosen the way of faithfulness. I run the path of your commands. It's the idea of going through the door and walking out my life. I go from my home, I go through the door, and I walk my life out according to your word. And so Daleth, as I'd mentioned before, it's the picture of a door. It's walking out from where you are to go through the door and walk in the ways of the Lord. Verse 33, the hey. Hey, teach me, Lord. Give me light. Give me understanding. Hey stands for light. It's it's behold. Let me see. Teach me. Cause me to see, Lord, the way of your decrees that I may follow it to the end. Give me understanding so that I may keep your law and obey it with all my heart. Direct me in the path of your commands, for there I find delight. And this Hebrew word for delight is this idea of your light shining, as was mentioned earlier. It's not just the light uh, within you, but the idea of your face shining, that I might delight, that I might smile. You know when people say smile, they say like you're brilliant, you're shining, you're bright. This is what he's talking about. And the hay, obviously, it's, it's, it stands for light, I, I'd mentioned before. Turn my heart towards your statutes, and not towards selfish gain. Listen to this again. It continues on about the eyes, about seeing, about light. Turn my eyes away from worthless things. Preserve my life according to your word. He makes this, this, these opposites, he makes these things that are, uh, 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 um, they're in opposition to each other. He says, turn my eyes away from worthless things, but preserve my life according to your word. So what he's, what he's talking about is that those things which are not according to his word are worthless, which it's, it's implying that his word is, has the highest worth there is. It's the greatest treasure. It's worth more than rubies and gold. That's so valuable. Turn my eyes away from the things that have no value, but preserve my life according to your word. Fulfill your promise to your servants so that you may be feared. Take away the disgrace I dread, for your laws are good. I long for your precepts in your righteousness. Preserve my life. Notice he's used that idea of preserving his life through the word that the word itself is eternal. One of the apostles had wrote, and I believe it was It was Peter, and I believe James quotes it, and a few others, that the word of God endures forever. Heaven and earth shall pass away. Jesus said it in the Gospels in Matthew chapter 5. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall never pass away. My words will endure forever. And so this idea that the word is eternal, that the word endures forever, that I can endure and be preserved through it. In your righteousness, preserve my life. Preserve my life according to your word. Verse 41, the Vav. May your unfailing love come to me, Lord, your salvation according to your promise. Then I can answer anyone who taunts me, for I trust in your word. Never take your word of truth from my mouth, for I put my hope in your laws. I will always obey your law forever and ever. Now notice the absolutes in this, in this uh, passage. Your unfailing love. In some of your translations, it might say mercy. The scripture said that his mercy endures forever. It's this idea of eternity. The vav is the connection between heaven and earth. It's the connection between past, present, and future. The idea of eternity appears many times in here, and even its opposite, never. He says in verse 43, never take your word of truth from my mouth. And listen to this in the, very last, in the very last verse of this part of the stanza. I will always, always and forever, right? I will always obey your law forever and ever. The connection past, present, and future for always. Continuously, the vav is shown up continuously through this passage. I will walk about in freedom, for I have sought out your precepts. I will speak of your statutes before kings, and will not be put to shame, for I delight in your commands because I love them. I reach out for your commands, which I love, that I may meditate on your decrees. The thing I forgot to mention also earlier is the vav also could be the picture of a staff, like a shepherd's staff, like the staff that that Moses held when he held it up to the Red Sea and the sea split, that staff that turned into a snake when he threw it down at Pharaoh's feet. 
that, that idea of the vob, that line with kind of the hook on the end, it's the idea of a staff. It could also be the scepter of a king. And here the psalmist says in verse 46, I will speak of your statute before kings. You know, the, 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 the picture of the scepter that a king holds is actually representative of the authority that God has given him. That God has given him this scepter that he is a connection between heaven and earth for the people. That the king is supposed to do good for the people. The king is supposed to do good for the people. If any leader comes up and rises up and does not do that which is good for the people, he is a wicked king. He is a wicked leader. He holds the scepter that he might wield the mercy and love and truth and justice of God for the people. And he says here, I will speak of your statutes before kings. It's this kind of juxtaposition where he puts himself in the place of the pauper speaking to the king, but he says, I'll speak of your statutes because your statutes before the king are much higher. The king might have authority, but I will speak of your statutes before the kings and will not be put to shame. He understands that authority comes from a higher place, not just the throne here on earth. It comes from heaven. That's why he says, I'm not afraid to speak the truth, even speaking the truth to power. I delight in your commands because I love them. I reach out for your commands, which I love, that I may meditate on your decrees. He, he ends this stanza with this connection between him and heaven. That connection, relationship is most important to him. I delight in your commands because I love them. I reach out for your commands which I love. Do you love the word? Do you love God's commands? Do you love his law? You know, it's been said that a, a Bible that is falling apart is a sign of a life that's not. How much time do you spend in the word like, you say that you love me. Like, for instance, with my wife, I could say that I love my wife all day. Do I spend time with her? Do I take the time to focus on her and me? And only that. Is our relationship that important? My friends, if you say you love God, do you love his word? And do you spend time in it? Do you set aside time for his word? Are you devoted to his commands? And I'm not saying just so you can have some rules to follow, but that you might know him because the word reveals who God is. And if you say you love someone, don't you want to know who they are? Remember that Goo Goo Dolls song, remember? I just want you to know my name. I just want you to know who I am. There's some of you 90s kids that get that. You remember that song? I just want, it's the idea of love. Like what he's singing is, I just want you to know who I am. And that's what the word does. It shows us who he is. That we could love him and we could see that he already loves us. It's not like God doesn't love us, oh, because we did this or we're some great thing or we accomplished this or we have great faith, then God loves us. No, God loved you before time began. God has always loved you. His mercy and his unfailing love endures forever. The scriptures say we love him because he first loved us. He loved us first and he calls us to him through his word, through his gospel. Do you love him? Do you know him? I think about these concepts about the door and the, 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 the humble poverty, behold, light, eternity, and, and the and and the connection and the hook in there, and I, I, I scoured the scriptures, and I'm, I've been studying and kind of doing two or three in advance and trying to be, be up and find this flow that happens in this song, and I, I found something remarkable to me, and I'm always trying to find something that Jesus said to connect to it. Is there some connection to Jesus with these concepts? Has, does he anywhere possibly speak of the Dalaf, the Hay, and the Vav all together? Yes, the answer is yes. Turn with me to Revelation chapter 3. Look at this. This is powerful to me. I love finding nuggets of gold like this in the scripture where you can find connection from the Old Testament to the New. Written thousands of years apart, but somehow perfectly lined up. These prophecies of Christ spoken of and then Christ himself speaking. 
Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God. Look at him, behold him, look at this, what he says. Revelation chapter three, starting in verse seven. To the angel of the church in Philadelphia, brotherly love is what that means, Philadelphia. These are the words of him who is holy and true, who holds the key of David. To the church of Philadelphia, the church of brotherly love, which is Philadelphia, it's, it's love and brothers. I hold the key of David, the beloved one, which is what his name means. His name also begins with the door and ends with the door. And then it has a pillar in the middle, the vav. So he has the key to the door of David. Now remember, David was the shepherd that became a king and held the scepter. Who? Are you starting to see all these things? Why I get so excited? I love these mysteries in Scripture. There's, so, there's a wealth of them. And this is just the first couple lines. He holds the king of, key of David. What he opens, no one can shut, and what he shuts, no one can open. Why? Because he himself is the door. Jesus says, I am the door, and I am the shepherd of the sheep. As he's speaking of David, who started out as a shepherd, became the king. Here, here is the king who came and says, I am the shepherd, I am the door, and I hold the key of David. Whatever I open, no one can shut it. Whatever I shut, no one can open. I know your deeds. See, look, behold, hey. I have placed before you an open door that no one can shut. I have placed before you an open daleth. Hey, <laughs> I know that you have little strength, yet you have kept my word and have not denied my name. I will make those who are of the synagogue of Satan who claim to be Jews, though they are not, but are liars, I will make them come and fall down at your feet and acknowledge that I have loved you. Since you have kept my command to endure patiently, I will also keep you from the hour of trial that is going to come on the whole earth to test the inhabitants of the earth. I am coming soon. Hold on to what you have so that no one will take your crown. Listen what he says next. The one who is victorious, I will make a pillar, a vav, the tent pole in the tabernacle. I will make you a pillar in the temple of my God. Never again will they leave it. He speaks of eternity. Never will they leave it. I will write on them the name of my God. Remember I mentioned hey? Hey is, is used twice in the name of God. I will write on them the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which is coming down out of heaven for my God from heaven to earth. In the beginning, God created the heavens, vav, earth the connection between heaven and earth jesus says that the new jerusalem comes down of he down from heaven to earth and it comes down from my god and i will also write on them my new name whoever has ears let him hear what the spirit says to the churches hold fast to what the scripture plainly says please hold fast Hold faithfully to what the scriptures plainly say. But I want to tell you, there is, a, there is a mystical and supernatural structure to this book. And it's undeniable. Things written about thousands of years before they came to pass testify to its authenticity. They testify to the one who created it, the one who inspired it, knew things before they happened. That should tell you the only way someone could know things before they happen is they, either they, they're, they're running some kind of juju or they are themselves outside of time, working in eternity. I choose to believe the latter, that the one who inspired Scripture, he is from eternity. That's how he could know what he knows, and he could speak to the prophets of the future. Over 2,000 prophecies were fulfilled by Jesus Christ in his first coming. 2,000. Now, of course, I don't have time to go through. You want me to go through all of them? No, I don't have time to go through all of them today. We'd be here till tomorrow and the next day and the next day and the next day. But I'm telling you, the scriptures make it clear who is the author. Now, we know that the pens and the hands of men were used, but the scriptures declare that it was the Holy Spirit that guided holy men of God to write as they were led. That we have 
the truth in our hands. Listen, if, if the Bible was just some fairy tale, why is it banned in over 50 countries? Listen, people don't, people don't get barred from reading Cinderella and Snow White. There's power in these words. There's something real, something supernatural in the word of God that wicked men have refused it, tried to burn it, tried to destroy it, but through the years, God has preserved his word because heaven and earth shall pass away, but his word endures forever. The one who is victorious, I will make a pillar in the temple of my God. I will make you the vav. I will make you the tent pole. I will make you the one who stands feet planted in the earth, but your hands reaching towards heaven. I will make you one of those. I will make you the end, God says. I believe that God is telling you, believer, that he wants to make you the connection between heaven and earth. The scriptures declare there is no plan B. The only ones who have been sent to bring the word from heaven to people is the church. You are that connection. He's not sending angels to preach the gospel. He's not sending miracles to preach the gospel. Know who he's sending? He's sending like a woman named Mary who comes to the tomb to, look, to, to take care of his body because she loves him and worships him and doesn't find the body, but then suddenly this gardener shows up. Or she mistakes him for the gardener. I, I wouldn't really call it a mistake because the first thing he did was make a garden, right? And he speaks to her and he says, go tell my brothers that I'm alive. Go be the and. Connect heaven to earth by preaching the gospel. You be the, temp the temple's pillar. You be the one who holds up heaven before men to see, look, this is Jesus Christ. He gave his life for you. He shed his blood that you might have eternal life, that you might enter into heaven, that you might be connected with God. Do you believe in him? Do you trust his word? I hope so. My prayer for our church is that we would, through the word of God, that we would become that connection, that we would be that pillar, that we ourselves would stand up for the truth, connect what God has said in heaven to the earth, that all men might know the name of Jesus Christ, that his banner would be planted on every hill, that all the kingdoms of the earth would become the kingdoms of our Lord and Savior. Are you with me? Do you believe it? Oh. We say amen. Amen means so be it. Or let it be. Let it be. Let it be. Speaking words of wisdom. Let it be. Right? Amen? Let's let it be. Like Let's th let this be true in our lives. Let's follow him, church. Let's show people Jesus. Let's shine our light so people can see our good deeds. And give praise to our Father in heaven. Will you stand with me for a word of prayer? Oh, Father God, thank you for making a connection with us, for, for sending your word down, just as you send the snow and just as you send the rain and it waters the earth and makes it bring forth. You've sent your word that life might spring up in us. Thank you for this life. Thank you for your word that brings life. Change our minds. Change our hearts. Rev this church up, Lord, that we be about your business every day, that we would wake up in the morning and remember what you said in your word, that we would meditate on your precepts and your laws and your commands, that we might walk out of our doors into the paths of our lives and show people Jesus at work, at school, and our families by loving and serving others in the name of Christ. And if the opportunity arises where we may speak truth, Lord, give us the words to speak. Give us your word. Remind us of what you say. Because I know, Lord, that your word in our mouths and your spirit living in us brings great power. Empower us to speak your word. It's what this world needs. It's what this community, it's what Ark City needs. Ark City needs to hear the truth, not just hear it, but see it in the lives of your people. I thank you for the work that's being done. I thank you for the ministry that happens on a daily basis. 
I thank you for all the different connections that we have in this church of people working with law enforcement and in the education system and in different places where they're being a light where they are, Lord. I pray for those who maybe are looking for a place, maybe don't know what they, they should be doing, Lord. I pray that you would give them a desire in their heart to pray to you and to ask that you would reveal, that you would give light, that you would show them, that you would let them see what it is that you have for them to do. Show us our purpose in you. Show us our will through your word. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, we're going to sing this song again. It's, it's becoming a habit of mine that I want to get stuff stuck in your head. You ever get a song stuck in your head? And like you, someone will say just a few lines and then you'll find yourself singing it three hours later. I'm hoping that this is what happens. Because it really truly is to sweet to trust in Jesus. That we need to take him at his word. We can trust what the Lord says. So we're going to sing this song again for our invitation. And while we're singing, if God's moving on your heart, if you feel like the Spirit's pulling at you, like you need to make a decision, you need, maybe you need to surrender your life to Christ. Maybe you need to, to, to surrender and say, hey, Lord, I'm, I'm going to quit running. I'm going to stay in church. I'm going to be committed. And maybe you want to be committed to this church. You want to make this your church home. I invite you to come. Maybe you're a believer in Jesus, but you've never been baptized. The water is ready. We got towels. We'll dry you up before we send you back out in the cold, all right? There's no reason. There's no excuse. If you haven't been baptized, you can get baptized today. So if you need to surrender your life to Christ, you need to get baptized. You're looking for a home church. I invite you to come as we sing. All right, and if you're not any of those three, just make this song your prayer. Make it your thought. Make it the melody in your heart all week long. It's sweet to trust in Jesus. Trust in Jesus. Trust his word. Amen.